Uh, look, good evening, everybody. Thank you very, very much for joining us this evening. Um, we're looking forward to having a fun evening this evening, um, uh, looking at some of your wonderful images that you've sent in to us. In the meantime, I am delighted to introduce you to my uh, my very great friend, Mark Cawardin. Um, you still can't pronounce my uh, name. Was that what you wanted me to say? We've been friends for 30 years. <laughs> anyway, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, look, Mark, it's lovely to have you here this evening, and um, it's uh, fantastic to see such a beautiful photograph of a sperm whale. So I know you've recently come back, haven't you, from um, from yeah, this was um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, in Dominica, um, trying to do one of those half and half shots, showing a bit of the can you can just see um, the land there, the island of Dominica, and some clouds, and the mm. female sperm whale just diving and. Because it's underwater with a very wide angle lens, I was probably three feet away from the whale. It's very deceptive, but um, wow. you could be very close, shoot through as little water as possible. And um, that's how you get the, the best underwater shots. Makes it clearer, sharper, and a bit more dramatic. Oh, it's wonderful. And on that trip, um, did you see uh, sperm whales regularly and did you did you have some I mean obviously this was a really good cycling of sperm whale but were you seeing them nice and close on most encounters yeah we, we I was there for just under a month and you get days of course with bad weather or no whales but overall we had lots of fantastic close encounters like this with the whales that are actually quite used to people they're very relaxed um you know they're up on the surface for quite long periods of time between dives or while they're socializing and um they will often come up to us. So, you know, we, we get in the water and maybe slowly swim to them. But very often, like on this occasion, I saw the whale coming and just kept coming, coming, coming. And um, I mean, if I'd leaned forward, it would have touched the end of my great big dome port on my underwater housing. So it's wonderful. It's a wonderful experience. Wow. It's hard to beat, actually, I have to say. Fantastic. And um, the water is obviously super clear. Yeah, it's lovely and warm because you're in and out of the water all day long. Now, can I just say something about this selection? So Emma in your office at while I've very think. kindly gone through the thousands of images people have sent in. And I just wanted to say, I've had a really quick look through just now. There's some real stunners among them. Um, but if yours didn't get in, I'm really sorry. Please don't take it as a, a measure of your photography at all because we were swamped with lots of stunning shots. So I'm sure we'll do this again, Chris sometime we'll try and get some more in yeah. uh, next time around we just had to be a bit selective in terms of numbers um just because otherwise we'll be talking all night and into the early hours of the morning so um, we just picked a few an, an arbitrary few at that Mark, do you, you want to kick on to the next kick on yeah so you, chris you're going to um chip in as well aren't you? this is another one of mine just to sort of set the scene this was in um the solomon islands uh just before christmas actually and tropical spotted dolphin in wonderful flat calm conditions. So I wanted to sort of explain where I'm coming from. So I've spent a lot of my time judging wildlife photography competitions, um, wildlife photographer of the year for many years and bird photographer of the year, British wildlife photographer of the year and, and many others. And when you do that a lot, you what you learn to do is you look for problems. So I'm very critical about yeah. photographs. So. I think one of the points about this is obviously there's some lovely shots. We're going to love them. And there's always something to love about every photograph. But um, the whole point is to give feedback. So please don't take anything we say um, badly. We, we, you know, we'll be honest about what we feel and what might improve and so on. And I would say it's um, also very subjective. You know, it's an art. It's not a science. So one thing I used to love when I was judging the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition as chairman of that would be when the final results were announced and there's the big exhibition at the Natural History Museum. I'd sometimes go and just creep around listening to people's comments and they'd be saying, oh my God, the judges are rubbish. They haven't got a clue. This one should have won. Why did that one win? And that's all part of the fun. You know, we all disagree. We all have our favourite sort of shots and favourite styles and that kind of thing. Um, and so it is very subjective. So please take that on board. What I've done here is just put I think if I could whittle it down to four things that I personally look for, um, there's the subject and that's obvious, but the subject can be anything, you know, and, and very often fine judging competitions is the most interesting pictures are the most 
common species that people don't tend to photograph a lot. You see thousands of polar bears and tigers and elephants and all that kind of thing. You very rarely see robins or house sparrows and so on. Um, so the subject doesn't actually matter. The point is it has to be obvious. You know, you can't, you can't look at a picture and think, well, what, what's he or she trying to show? It has to be very clear what you're trying to do. Composition we'll talk about um, during the course of the evening. Light is absolutely fundamental. You, need, you can have a, a, a photograph of an extremely rare, virtually never photographed species. But if the light's bad, if it's really horrible, harsh light, for example, it's still going to be a poor image. You know, but it could be a very common, familiar species in gorgeous light. And that will lift it to another level. So that's the third thing that I'm personally looking for. And the fourth is, I called it extra special ingredient. And what I mean by that is anything ab above and beyond those first three. So it could be heavy rain or snowfall or a rainbow or action or some interesting behaviour or something different that lifts the image to a, a different level. So that's the sort of background uh, to what we're talking about. Let's go first into the first photograph. This is by Alan Dixon, um, an Arctic fox, obviously. This is, I don't know what you think, this is absolutely stunning. I'm looking at it on the big screen on my other monitor here. Absolutely wonderful shot. I'd be so happy if I'd taken that picture for lots of reasons. So it's very interesting looking at a lot of people's photos is the animal's big in the frame. And it's very tempting. If you remortgaged your house, you know, to buy like a long 600 mil lens, you want to jolly well use it. And so the tendency, the temptation is to always fill the frame. I think one of the great skills is to know when to pull back and when the, the background, the surroundings are as important to the image as they are here to the fox. It's very simple background, but it really gives a, a wonderful sense of place. And the light is gorgeous. That blue backdrop is absolutely gorgeous. And I think... Many of the, in my view, many of the best wildlife photographs ever taken have been of animals small in the frame. I mean, they call it um, animals in their environment in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. And it's a great way, there's two things. One is, if you can't get close enough, it's a really great way of dealing with that. And the other is, if you can't afford a great long lens, then you can shoot great photos with a, a shorter lens. And the trick is to observe the background and see where you're shooting. And if, I don't know if, you, if, if Alan was in a boat from this or, or what, where he was shooting from. But um, if you can move a couple of feet one way or a couple of feet the other way, get the angle slightly differently, get that lovely clean background, then it can really work very effectively. Presumably you, you love this as well. Uh, I think it's an absolute stunner. I, I, um... mm. Uh, I'm a bit of a sucker for the colour blue, actually, and I um, and I like that the, the, there are elements of blue that are reflected onto the mm -hmm. skin of the Arctic, onto the fur of the Arctic fox, which I which I just love. I I think it's absolute corker. There's even a bit of backlighting around the fur. You get that rim light showing all the fur. Uh, wonderful, wonderful shot. We could talk Probably about that for hours. So Claire Waring, hello Claire. I know Claire. Um, and for Claire, I assume this was probably Snow Hill, I don't know. Um, this is the opposite to the Arctic Fox. And what I love about this is it's really tight shot. I think that the mistake a lot of people make is they take pictures where the, the subject falls into what I call a, a, a no man's land, you know, where it's not small enough in the frame and it's not big enough in the frame. And we've seen two extremes that work really well. The Arctic Fox, very small in the frame, and these emperor penguins filling the frame basically lovely juxtaposition of the two adults and the and the chick i love the symmetry of them the adults are facing the same way almost exactly the same angle um and it's very nicely turned into black and white it's another skill is to get all those shades of gray in between the pure black and the pure white and i think claire's done a wonderful job with that one can i just throw something in there i think i think yeah. it's um no, who, who, who would have thought that a photograph of three penguins without their heads um, would actually work quite so well as this one? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, not the obvious shot, is it? No, it's not. And I think what you have to do sometimes, somewhere like Snow Hill, it's completely overwhelming. In fact, anywhere in the Antarctic, you've been there several times, I know, you, um, you land somewhere 
and there's so much to see and, and so much to photograph. And I, you know, I get that you want to get the record shots and get the heads and get the colonies and do all the standard shots that everybody gets. As soon as you've done that, that's the time. Don't, don't just spend all the rest of the landing shooting more of those because you'll just end up with lots of the same. Then you can start getting creative. And that's what Claire's done. You know, she's, I'm sure she bagged all the pictures that people tend to take there. And then she's trying to be artistic and do something different. And it's worked really, really well, I think. Lovely. Or oh, something completely different. <clears throat> Go on, Chris, I'm talking too much. Yep. You... Well, yeah, that's unusual for you to even admit it, isn't it, Mark? <laughs> um, I, I, well, I tell you exactly what I love about this one. Having having done quite a lot of photography in and around rivers and um, you know overhanging trees and so on, I know how incredibly difficult it is to get a shot like this. Uh, because invariably, whatever it is you're trying to photograph ends up underneath the leaves and in the shade and away from all of the good lighting areas. So I think this is an absolute cracker, and I, I love the shape of the fish. I, I, I'm presuming that's a an inga of some description. Yeah, I think it's an anhinga um, and a pipe fish. Um, uh, but I I particularly like the curiously the the, the shape of the um, of the fish that it's caught. And the fact that the tail doesn't touch the eye. No, it, I was going to um, uh, point uh, that doesn't touch the eye of the Anhinga. Somehow or other, it brings yeah. uh, brings that eye into sharp focus. And it's a cracker. And I love the green in the background. It's beautiful. I was going to say exactly the same. I think Alan's done a fantastic job here. Where I mean, I don't know if you you, you just took the one, Alan, and you were, you were lucky and got the positions right. If I'm in a situation like that, then I'll just fire away. Very often, I won't take pictures other people will be shooting, but if it's not quite right, I'll just not take anything. But when you get a situation like this where, you know, something really great could happen or is happening, then I'll fire hundreds and hundreds of shots. And the reason for doing that is that gives you the chance of getting everything in exactly the right position much higher. So like you said, the beautiful curl of, I think it's a pipefish, but the pipefish just missing the eye, almost a complete hole, sort of semicircle, if you like. I mean that's wonderful. Alan, maybe Alan is is a lot quicker than me, and he can get it in one shot. But normally you'd take a lot, and then you'd go through, and there'd be one image in the sequence that just stands out, and that would yep. be that one. And it's it's fantastic. Works really really well. And also, of course, we're seeing the eye of the fish that's being caught. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. You can even see that. It's, anyway. Everything's at the right angle. It's amazing. Another yep. one I'd be very happy yep. with. Lovely. So Denise has sent something completely different. And I love the way you're shooting through the foliage, Denise. That's a really nice shot. You know, it would be a nice shot if you just got, I think it's a, a juvenile green woodpecker, isn't it? Um, you've just got the woodpecker um, coming out of the hole, sticking its head out of the hole in the tree. But by adding that foliage and a bit of blur on the left-hand side, I think you've added a, a lot to the photograph. Um, one thing I would do, and I've, I've actually done this just now while Chris and I were chatting before coming on, um, is slightly flat. So let me show you my version of it. And I, I know what sort of monitors you're all looking at. On. Hopefully all your monitors are, are, um, are calibrated because I know people don't like that. They don't like talking about calibrated monitors, but it's very easy to do. And uh, calibrator costs like 60, 70 quid. And once you've calibrated it, so my monitor's calibrated and I've processed that picture to look right on my monitor, which is the industry standard. If your monitor's calibrated, you're going to see the picture exactly as I do. If it's not, it might not look great. So let's just go back to, oh, hang on a second. That was the original one that Denise sent us. That's and it's original. quite subtle. Can you see the difference? Slightly punchier, brighter, um, not overdoing it. Richer colour. Pardon? richer colors yeah just a little bit stronger a bit more punch to it and um i think that's added a little something but i love the shot and there's something very nice about looking and shooting through foliage and gaps it any naturalist can relate to that it gives a real sense of place and you know how many times we all watch some wonderful animal through through the foliage or through some gap um and and just seeing it without it seeing you necessarily it's great really lovely so this is another completely different subject from Nick Rogers. Um, I think this is the perfect moment. It's uh, obviously mm -hmm. 
both cobs are in the right position. So one looking right down the barrel of the lens and the other one poor just touching its uh, sibling. And it's a wonderful, wonderful shot, nice and low. This is another thing about wildlife photography is it's in most cases, it's really important to get down to their level. So I don't know, this may have been shot from a boat or a hide, I don't know, but um, you've got to get down low because, you know, when you're photographing your family, you don't get a stepladder in the dining room or the lounge and stand at the top of the stepladder and shoot them from that. You're at the family's level, you're at eye level. If you can be at the bear's level or the penguin's level or whatever it is you're photographing, it's more intimate. Um, you're looking at it from a bear's point of view. Um, another great advantage is you can blow the background out of focus more easily because by being low down, the background's further away. Um, if you're standing up or higher looking down, it looks like it's a human point of view, which you don't want. And the background is much closer, so it's going to be more in focus and it'll fight with the subject. So this shot ticks all those boxes. I think my one criticism would be, again, a little bit with the processing, could punch it up a little bit. That might be, I, I assume Nick's using a calibrated monitor. If not, it might look great on, on an uncalibrated monitor. It doesn't look so punchy and bright on, on mine, but it's just something to bear in mind. All right, shall we move on, Chris? Oh, I was just going to say one of the things that I particularly like about that is the fact that the bears, uh, the, the bears, uh, the bears look imperfect, and um, yeah, because that's what wildlife is like. I like that, you know, the shaggy, shaggy fur, and um, you can see well, you can see the rain at, at the top in a dark area yeah. of the of the, um, of the photograph, and the rain on the fur is lovely. It, it, Sorry, it, yeah, it, yeah, carry on. You're right. I've got to mention the rain. It just adds to the picture. There's that extra little ingredient. Oh, nice, nice variety of subjects we're getting. I'm not sure. Is that a comma or a large tortoiseshell? I'm not sure, actually. Are you good on British butterfly? Um, is it British? I mean, I'm terrible on anybody butterfly, but I don't think it's a little comma. Bit. A comma, do you think? I don't think it, it doesn't, the, the, um, the, uh, the margins of the wings don't look um, deep enough, but I, 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 I would, I, I, anyway. I, well, you're the naturalist, hang well, on. I'm not a butterfly expert. You see, this sort of makes the point is that in a way the subject doesn't matter. It's a beautiful shot, very nicely observed shot. Repeating patterns are very, very good. And I, I love the temp that Anthony hasn't been tempted to get in really tight. He's used the, the, the background, the setting to make, to build a picture basically. And uh, I remember a landscape photographer, a friend of mine once said a great way to, to, as he called it, make a picture of a landscape or a picture of an animal in a landscape. If you've got the time, and of course landscape photographers have got centuries, doesn't move. Um, what you do is you, you put the, the lens into manual focus and you blur it. And then what you're seeing is you're not seeing a butterfly and plants or rocks or rivers or trees or whatever it is you're photographing. You're seeing shapes and colours. And I think that's a wonderful way of looking at it because... That, that's what I mean about the subject doesn't matter so long as it's obvious is you're, what you're doing in a picture like this is you're blending shapes and colours and making that symmetry. My only criticism, go and see if you've spotted it. I've got one criticism of this shot and it's minor because I love the shot. Chris, you get three points. Um, well, I... <laughs> I tell you. Um, well, I, 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 no, hang on. I'm not going to give you a criticism. I'm first going to give you a positive. Which is one of the things that I particularly like. This is this that this, this, the, the position of the wings is uh, is similar in position to the um, to, to the plant that it that it sat on. But mm -hmm. if I was going to make an adjustment, I would crop it in such a way that I lost the green um, element on the right hand side yeah, of the image. Three points. That's, that would be my only. No, I think I, I, I the Joker. I'm going to double it up to six. Actually, if that's all right. <laughs> I mean, I love the shot, don't get me wrong, but if you've got the symmetry and the repetition of pattern and all the rest of it, your eye does, you look at the butterfly, then your eye goes to the green bit and it's a, it's a slight distraction. And, you know, it's all very well talking about this from the office or from home. When you're in situ shooting the animal, you may only have a couple of seconds to do it. So it's a bit rich saying that, but if, in an ideal world, that would be my one change. Yeah. Yeah, okay. super photograph. 
Yeah, wonderful. Well, the standard is really, really high. This, David, I love this one. Um, this is a was a yellow throated toucan. Um, so somewhere central and uh, I think it's northwestern South America. The rain is that extra ingredient, and the, well, it's obviously a beautiful toucan. Yep. So you know the subject is outstanding. Um, the rain really adds to the shot. My only my only slight criticism would be it's covered slightly by the foliage. And I think if it had been this side of the foliage and had a clear view of the toucan would have been a stronger shot. And you may have done this, David, as well, but given that it's that side, I would have pulled back even further. I love the fact you've pulled back and given plenty of space to show the, the raindrops. And that works really well because they really jump out from the, the, um, the background. But I would have pulled back even more so that you you get more shape in the leaves and the branches and so on. And then the, the toucan is a smaller part of the frame and therefore the fact it's hidden by the branches a little bit isn't so important. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Actually, I hadn't thought of it from that point of view. I, I particularly like the fact that it's in the lower half, that, that, that the screen mm -hmm. is almost split in two, top and bottom, with the, with the top being... Um, largely rain and leaves and the bottom being um, leaves and toucan um, and for me that works really nicely and I particularly like that the, the well this is down to the toucan as opposed to the photographer so forgive me but I particularly like the black and yellow combination which is on <laughs> toucan um, but in comparison with the with the background and the leaves I think it works beautifully because but of course the, the eye colour is exactly the same the leaves. David, David did spot it. the toucan he gets an award for that I mean he did photograph it so <laughs> But yeah, I agree. I mean, when, you, when you're doing animals smaller in the frame like this, the rest of the frame has to work. And it does in this case because, because of the rain largely, but also because the continuation of those beautiful leaves and so on. Um, what you don't want is to leave space. It's just empty space. There needs to be something in it to, or, or a beautiful color wash like the Arctic Fox at the beginning. Um, I, I, I do like the shot. I think it works really well. I, and maybe David did do this, but I've experimented. As soon as I realise that it's behind everything, I pull right back and make that less critical. Okay, Peter. Um, well, one of my favourite subjects, dolphins. I I don't know where this was taken, but they they look like Indian Ocean humpback dolphins to me. You can just see the humpback and that that white um, tip to the beak and a slightly white lips is fairly typical. Um, that's a really lovely shot. Must have been a fantastic encounter because beautiful calm sea and then you can see the water movement from the boats are obviously swimming right alongside the boat um it's a lovely shot i mean perfect moment again you've got to take a lot or get really lucky to get two with the beaks above the surface i love the spray of the water making a lovely shape i love the spray behind the dorsal fin um it's, it's a it's a really really great shot i mean Again, the only thing, and, I'm, and forgive me because I'm always looking for fault. As I say, that's just how I how I look at wildlife photographs from the competitions. Is my criticism would be the water from the boat, and an even better shot. And I love the shot. Even better shot would be if they moved away slightly, and you know maybe they didn't. Um, but if that if I get an encounter like that, I'll be very aware of them moving slightly backwards and forwards. If they move away enough to get clean water all the way round, not the boat wash, then that would be the, the shot I'd be going for. And it would be one bit, one level higher than this. But it's a, it's a beautiful moment. I love it. There's, a, there's another thought, though, in relation to that, Mark, which is that the fact that you can see the um, <clears throat> um, a little bit of a wash from the boat does enable you to just you know, realize how close you are to the dolphins and it does enable you to kind of make you you know i'm right i'm right there with them yeah you know, they're, they're not in the distance they're, they're really close to me and that's i mean that's quite an exciting thought when you're looking at a photograph isn't it it depends what you want from the photograph so that would work very well in an editorial in a magazine like bbc wildlife magazine because this is a yeah. new species only only named in 2014 um, and that would show, illustrate the fact they do approach boats and they might barrel ride and that kind of thing. If it was a piece of art to book on a wall, then it would be better without the boat yeah, wash. So you, you can argue both ways, I think. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what that one is. But you don't know what that is. 
Yeah, you don't know what it is. I don't think, what is it? I know it's a tern. What species of tern is it? It's a carmine bee eater. No, it's not. It's a black-bellied tern. Is that? Um, it's a black-bellied tern from, uh, uh, well, India and Nepal, I think, but, um, but in India primarily, um, an Indian resident. It's a beautiful bird. I, I did actually, when I looked at it, first of all, first glance, I thought it was probably a black-bellied tern. Um, uh, sorry, um, a, um, a white-bellied black tern um, with a name of which is, is all changed in Africa. Anyway, it's not an African species, it's an Indian species. Do you remember that TV series Soap? At the beginning, it said confused you will be. <laughs> so I'm, I'm still. I'm, what? Which? What, what is it? I've lost track now. What you said? It's black belly turn. Okay. That's what I said right at the beginning. Okay, great. Well, um, can't mind. it's a it's lovely light. It's a, a very yeah, well gorgeous. captured shot, Andy. And the background is. St I love these pure color wash backgrounds, and that that beautiful orangey brown color is is really wonderful. Um, the light's great because look at those bright red feet. They really stand out. Um, my only criticism, the head's turning slightly away and it would be slightly better if it was facing more angled towards, the, not right to the camera, but a bit more angled to the white. Um, but that's a detail. I, I think I'm probably one of the few people who looks at and thinks like that because I'm so, I'm so picky and critical. But... Um, Apart from that, it's gorgeous and the tail feathers, everything pops because it's it's such beautiful light and such a nice diffuse background. It works really, really well. And the beautiful extension of that left wing is that was was what I think probably the first thing that I noticed. And then the yeah. second thing I noticed on the image when I was looking at it earlier is the um uh it um what appears to have, I mean, it's not serrated, but it kind of looks like the serrated edge of the of the of the right wing, which doesn't actually cut off the foot, but you, it's exaggerated by the beautiful black on the on the belly of the bird. I love it, actually love it, and the contrasting red of the feet, it's fantastic. Really nice. We're going to have to speed up because even with cutting it right back, we're going to have yeah, to speed. Right so it's your fault. You're talking too much. Um, sorry, I'll keep it shorter. A Eurasian lynx, obviously. Um, there's a lot I like about this shot. It's lovely composition, nice and low. Pour in the air is, is wonderful. I love that look. You don't always want the subject to be looking in the camera. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. And it, it, it's intriguing. So the, 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 the links is, the head is over to the left of the frame and it's looking to the right. There's so lots of space for it to look into. It feels comfortable. And of course, you immediately wonder what it might be looking at. The fact of not looking at the photographer is a bonus because it suggests that maybe it doesn't know the photographer is there. It's completely relaxed and so on. My criticism would be it's very tight. So with a shot like this, I would um, I would like to pull back a little bit or get an even tighter. I don't know, Annette, what the situation was when you were shooting it, but... Um, it's a beautiful face and fur and so on. So I would either have gone in and done a tight portrait or pulled back. It just feels it's very close to the edges of the frame and, and usually you want a little bit of breathing space just around it. Um, so again, I'm being picky, but that, that's what I would, if it was a great situation, you had a little bit of time to play, I'd do a mix of tight shots, shots pulling back a little bit and less of this where it's perfectly filling the frame but it's neither one or the other. Okay, this is, this is sort of what I've just been talking about, actually. So, in fact, Chris, I think I might have been right next to you when you took that shot. Um, that was in the think, if I'm mm -hmm. right, the Great Bear Rainforest. I think I recognise that very bear. Um, when you have really bright sunshine, it can be very right. difficult to photograph, you know, harsh lights and so on. But if you've got a situation where you've got the sunshine providing a spotlight and very dark shadow behind, that can work really, really well. And uh, that's what makes this bear leap out. It's um, It really pops from the frame because it's against that dark riverbank on the other side. And um, we were right down low against the water when Chris took it. And I don't think I, I, I took a lot myself with the same bear, but I think Chris has got a particularly nice one with the paw just coming out. So again, it's a reason to take a lot of shots when it's going well, when something really dramatic is happening. The great thing with digital, you know, if you brought up in the days of film, it's still ingrained. 
to to be careful and not to waste waste in inverted commas pictures but now you can just fire away it takes seconds to get rid of all the rubbish and to pick out the best shot um the light on the eye that's beautiful both eyes in fact uh, the eyes aren't in shade yeah. so as it walked along there were moments when there was shade over the eyes that that didn't work at all and of course the other bonus is the gorgeous color of the water that golden color just adds yet another dimension to the whole image so chris i think you've done a a really great job there with that one do you agree chris? on a mission isn't it chris? Pardon? Uh, well i do i think there's, there's a number of fabulous things about it a it was taken in what i know is um one of our favorite places <clears> in the world to run trips um, but also it's a bear on a mission and uh, I like that you can see that in its eyes it's very it's not can not um, bothered yeah. by the photographer it's, um, you know it, it's on a mission it knows what it's going to do it's, it's a yeah. it's a cracking shot it is lovely well what a nice variety of styles and subjects nice. so, it's it's lovely, isn't it? um, so Susie I love this shot I love the way you composed it to me the the rainbow is balanced by that little tree on either side of the frame um, I'm, I can imagine that rainbow is as it was at the time. One one thing people make, and I'm not saying Susie has because it looks realistic to me, but what a lot of people do is they they have a slider on their Lightroom or Photoshop, and just because it goes all the way to the right, they pump everything up, and it destroys the shot. Many wonderful pictures I've seen entered in competitions have been dropped, um, you know, in early rounds simply because they're oversaturated. So the key is to capture that reality, which I think Susie's done really nicely there. So the thing that strikes me here is the two wildebeest on the right are great. Um, there's one in the middle that's standing up and looking up, and the others annoy me a little bit. And that's the wildebeest's fault, not Susie's fault. But again, it's another reason for shooting a lot of pictures and hoping that one is going to be where there's more of them in a mm -hmm. in a comfortable position, not half the head hidden. It's okay with a few, but you see there's a lot of overlap in the middle there. You can't quite work out what's going on, what's what. Um, I mean, and there, I have to say there are some photographers who would take a sequence and then take the best wildebeest from each shot and make a shot. And I, that, I think that's terrible myself, manipulating and basically lying about what you saw is wrong. So. It's all down to what the wildebeest do. But maybe there's another one in the sequence, Susie, with a few more in a lovely position. So the two in front of the rainbow are just perfect. Spot on. You can see all the detail. And they're the most important two, of course, because uh, they're right there in front of all the colours. But have a look and see if you've got any other in the sequence where they're a little bit, a few more with the head up or walking um, side on exactly and so on. And, and see if that might be a slightly better shot. It's a lovely, it's a lovely photo. Sorry, not Mark. I'm just going to moving on to the next one. I just wonder, um, if you were cropping it, would you um, perhaps uh, slightly reduce the amount of grass, um, just because the rainbow is so beautiful and it, it's it's such a positive on the photograph. Yeah, possibly the the grass isn't really adding anything. Um, if it was completely blurred color wash, if you were able to get out of the safari vehicle, lie on the ground and blur it completely to a colour wash, that might work, or probably would work. But you can see quite a lot of detail there, and there's nothing there to really add to the picture. A lot of these things are as much about what you leave out as what you put in. Everything in the picture has to work and add to it and be a critical part of it. Um, so, yeah, that's a good point, actually. I'd, I'd experiment by cropping maybe half of that out and having more sky with the rainbow because it's a lovely deep you know gray um rainy sort of sky so that might work really well again it's a bit of experimentation with a lot of these shots i will um shoot wide um just give a bit more than i think i'm going to want instead of always trying to shoot exactly how i want to see it cropped at the end of the day because that gives you a bit more room for maneuver and then you get home and things like that strike you think well actually maybe if i just done it this way a bit higher up You've got that option. Okay, Chris. So Chris was with me in Hungary um, last year. I think he's coming with me again, aren't you, Chris, in um, April this year. And um, I wasn't with him in the hide when he had a goshawk, very annoying, but he had a, a wonderful encounter with a goshawk. And I remember 
him coming back and raving about it and everybody being very happy for him. Um, this is a great shot, Chris. The, the, the spray with it, when it, with it washing is wonderful. The backlighting, the background is beautiful, blurry. Again, it gives a sense of place. My criticisms would be, well, the obvious one is chopping the feet off. Um, and I think when you do that, the, the trick is to to make it with all cropping. And if you've done, if you made a mistake and you've chopped the feet off, or you've chopped a wing tip off, or something like that, the trick is to make it look intentional. So one of the advantages of having cameras nowadays with lots of megapixels is you've got more leeway for cropping. And if you've accidentally done that, then crop more, more, and then it doesn't look like a mistake. And so people won't necessarily analyze it like that, but subconsciously it looks like a better photograph. And I think you could bring out a little bit of the um the the, the color or the, the light in the body of the, the bird. And of course, the other thing is looking out of the frame. It sort of works, it can work very, very well when there's a lot going on in the rest of the frame, which there is. I've just taken the liberty of Chris and, and very quickly, and this is with the slide for the slideshow, so it's not definitely not the best quality. But I've just done a little um, variation on that. And I don't know how big your file was or anything like that, but to show what I mean. So it feels a bit more comfortable with the bird looking out. I've brightened the, the, the breast feathers a little bit, not overdone it, so it's not artificial. Otherwise, it looks like you've been fiddling with it and kept enough space around there to show the, the spray and the water, a bit of the green, a bit of the blue. So that was the one you sent in, Chris. And that was the the slight variation on it. And again, it's subjective, but for me, I prefer that shot for those reasons, looking out of the frame, uh, confidently cropping the bottom of the bird off instead of just the feet and keeping the flavor of the occasion. Janet, I think I was with you when this happened as well, Janet. This was in um, Great Bear Rainforest, um, humpback whale tail breaching. I've never known how they do that. I've seen it from the drone, actually. They actually reverse out of the... We you know when whales breach, come out head first. You can imagine they kick their tails and they launch themselves out of the water. But a tail breach, the, the, the power and how they come out backwards and do that flip, I, I'll never know. Um, it's a lovely moment. And I, I would say you picked exactly the right shot in the sequence, knowing how they do it. That's the perfect shot where you can see the back and the dorsal fin got all that wonderful spray covering the tail and you can you're looking straight onto the upper side of the tail and um, a couple of things i'd just do to improve it janet would be to straighten the horizon a little bit and that i mean when you're shooting whales at sea and many other wildlife subjects it's very difficult to get the horizon straight another reason why i i shoot a little bit wider so there's room for maneuver um and i think that's fine just to straighten that and then uh, you've got a lot of dead space at the front. So that water doesn't really add to the photograph. So I'd crop some of that, like we were talking about with the wildebeest, just experiment cropping a little bit tighter on the humpback and uh, straightening it. Then I think you've got yourself a, a stunning shot. And it's, it's beautifully exposed as well. Looking on this monitor, you've got all the detail in the black of the humpback and in the white of the spray, which is really quite difficult to do. Oh, here you are. Chris, this is your department. Africa, Paul, honey badger. This is in Africa. Yeah. <laughs> honey badger, killing termites. What a, I mean, this is a corker. Um, uh, uh, they're hard enough to see at the best of times, aren't they? Um, yeah. Let alone in uh, good light like this. And you'll, I've got two, I've got my, this image on two different monitors, one which is calibrated and one isn't. Um, and on my calibrated monitor, it looks, well, it looks beautiful on both monitors actually, but even mm -hmm. better on the calibrated monitor. I love it. I, it's um, it's an action shot, and um, uh, cu curiously because the termites and and uh, you don't often see an action shot with a of a honey badger, so uh, it, it's a it's a cracker as far as I'm concerned. I love it. I, I really like as well, and in, you know you could argue the lower down if you're lower down on the ground, the background would have blurred, but I can imagine it would have been a very quick grab shot. And um, yeah. I mean, I think I've only seen honey badgers about twice in my life. It's, um, you don't get to see many good pictures of them. And this is one of the best I've seen in a long time. So I think Paul's done a fantastic job. If you would had lots of time and if you could have got lower, that would have improved the shot. One thing that um, I do sometimes, and a lot of photographers do, 
um, particularly on African safaris, is to have have two camera bodies. One you're shooting normally, and one is on a monopod. And if you've got the time, you can then put the monopod down very close, the camera on the end of the monopod down very close to the ground and fire remotely. Um, and it's a little bit hit and miss, but then you can, if you're lucky, get those shots where you're shooting very low to the ground, blur the foreground and blur the background. I'd say in, in a situation like this, you probably didn't, didn't even have time to do that, even if you were set up for it. So it's a very tricky subject. I think it's a lovely, lovely shot. Aha, hummingbird. Um, it's one of your favourites, well, isn't it? Hummingbird. What did you say? Rufus tail? Look, looks like Rufus tail. I'm not sure where um, it was taken. But... I would have to pass on that. Yeah. Anyway, there's lots of things I like about this. Beautiful colour wash background. Very nice, sharp bird pops from the background. You can see, I think it is a Rufus tail hummingbird. You can see that. Anyway, you can see the beautiful Rufus tail. Perfect position, absolutely perpendicular to the lens. The thing I like about it is its natural light. Now, when you see hummingbird pictures, you know, I don't know if Peter tried with um, with with flash guns as well, but many people go on hummingbird shoots and they're using six, seven, eight flash guns all set up like a studio set up um, in the forest or, or in a lodge garden or something. And that can be very effective. It can work really well, but it means that a lot of the pictures look very similar. And shooting in natural light, maybe there's a bit of full flash, I don't know, but it's a more natural looking shot. It's lovely. I really like it a lot. Um, to get those wings, I'm looking on my other monitor where it's full screen. It is tack sharp. So my guess is you were shooting, Peter, maybe a four thousandth of a second, something like that. If I'm shooting hummingbirds in flight, never go slower than three thousand two hundredth of a second. And even then, sometimes you get the the ends of the wings. They're beating so fast, just slightly blurry. And I'd experiment. I mean, that might work as well. So get the beautiful, beautiful tack sharp shot like that. And then reduce the shutter speed a little bit and try blurring the wings to varying degrees to get that sense of movement and uh, to see if that works as well. But I mean, that's not a criticism of this. It's just a, a, maybe getting several very different shots out of one particular encounter. But I, I love that shot. It's wonderful. Nick. Hello, Nick. <clears throat> um, this looks like Baja. Do you recognise that? That backdrop in the Sea of Cortez, Chris, you can't really um, fail to recognise it, can you? I think that's cool, yeah. um, Humpback whale, lovely shot. I love shooting whale blows or spouts into the sun because uh, it just lights them up. I mean, you, you, if you're shooting from the other side of the humpback, shooting with the sun over your shoulder, as you tend to do with a lot of wildlife photography, that blow would just disappear against the backdrop. So I think that's wonderful the way you've captured that. Um, again, maybe a little bit more space. I don't know if you cropped it, but I'd cropped slightly higher at the bottom and slightly higher at the top, just shift the whole thing up a little bit. And um, it looks quite dark. You could maybe brighten the whale slightly, just do a little bit of jiggery pokery, which I think is is fine. You, as long as you, as long as you don't add anything or take anything away, then you're not manipulating. And I think, you know, Ansel Adams famously did and he was very open about it, honest about it, lots of dodging and burning with his wonderful landscapes, just to bring out the detail and the shadows and bring back that the highlights and so on. I think, Nick, if you did a little bit of fiddling with that, you'd, you'd improve the picture uh, a little bit. You'd see more of the whale, it'd be bright. It wouldn't look as if it was taken um, almost in the dark and you'd still keep that beautiful lit blow. But again, this is me being picky. I think it's a, it's a lovely shot and shooting at that angle is, is brilliant. Brilliant. Chris. Hmm. Well, I, uh, I think this is an unusual shot because, um, because the butterflies, uh, and that's what makes it, isn't it? Um, the butterflies around the eye, um, uh, the uh, the croc or alligator, I'm not sure which. I should Cayman, be an alligator. Um, Cayman. Cayman. Oh, Cayman. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, yeah, it looks. Yeah. Um, 
but it's almost smiling, isn't it? It's almost delighted to have the butterflies there somehow or other in that in that photograph. It's it, it's a it's a wonderful shot. It's um uh, I'm not familiar with the butterflies, I'm afraid. Um, so I don't know Actually, what I do they know are. Not that is. I know those because I remember when I first saw one, um, thinking what an absolutely fantastic name. It's called Amazon Beauty Butterfly. It's one of those animals. Oh, in, well, yeah, are, that's they? exactly what it should be called. It's like some animals just just pick the perfect name. Like what's that one? The the fried egg jellyfish <laughs> and the blobfish. Looks oh. like just put, dropped it from a height and it's just gone blob. Some animals they just suit their names. I think that really deserves the Amazon Beauty Butterfly. And I agree. I mean. Nice low position. Is it all tack sharp? Yeah, I mean, the depth, the eyes tack sharp. The teeth are wonderful. The butterflies. The backdrop is nice and blurred. One criticism: it's slightly facing away. I think. It, 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 again, it, if it was slightly going this way, maybe um, Maria, you, you took a sequence and it moved slightly. I just have a look. So you've got another one where it's just a little bit more facing this way. But again, I'm being picky. It's a it's a beautiful shot, lovely light, perfectly exposed, nicely observed and, and really well captured. Or perhaps have a little bit more background on the right hand side, but it's, it's yeah, it doesn't yeah, you really do take that. anything yeah. away from the Yeah. And again, it's it, lovely. It, you know, lovely. Been, uh, Maria, you probably took a lot of shots. It was such a wonderful occasion. Um, have a look and see if any slight variations on that theme. Again, Chris, your department, Africa. Wow, that's another beauty, isn't it? Um, uh, well, I would. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I'd be, <laughs> I'd be very happy with that. The, uh, the 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 shape of the of the face is almost cushioned on the uh, on the out of focus leaves in the foreground, and uh, they make the most beautiful frame. Uh, for the face and the whiskers, uh, which I just absolutely love. Um, uh, I guess if, if there was, uh, oh, this is awful. I, I mean, if, if there was one teensy weensy thing I would adjust, um, incidentally, I never get photographs as good as this. Uh, you know, who am I to criticize? But uh, um, if there's one very, very minor thing I would adjust, it would be the blade of grass on the right hand side of the, uh, on the right hand side of the image. Um, but but in actual fact, your eye is drawn to the eyes of the animal, in which case it's really not an issue. Isn't it funny? It's so subjective because that I actually quite like that blade of glass because it grass because it shows a, oh, a a sense of place. It's sort of in the in the undergrowth, and if it was across the eye, yeah, that would be annoying. And as I said before, there are photographers out there who would remove that. You could get rid of it in Photoshop in a heartbeat, but. I would never do it myself, and I think um, Jane's right to leave it in there. The one thing I do be to—I mean, the light no, is absolutely there. stunning. But I said it's right that it's there. It's absolutely right that yeah, it's there I do love because it. that's where it was. I would crop it slightly. So if you look above the leopard's head, there's a lot of dark space which isn't really adding anything. You just need a, a hint of those grass stems. And I would so I'd crop some of that out and a bit of the right hand side and just move it slightly because you've got that lovely, the, the leopard um, fur on the left, make more of that and just crop it slightly so the head of the leopard is more to the right. You've got less of that dead space up at the top. But um, that's easy to fiddle with in the computer. I think Jane's done a, a wonderful job and it's, it's just gorgeous lighting, ticks every box. Right, Chris, you've got to speed up. Serena, so yeah, we have. Um, we'll be here. Pardon? I won't be here till about midnight, otherwise. But aren't they fantastic shots? Oh, that's gorgeous. <laughs> Lovely face vultures, aren't they? So, Serena, I assume you've done this by by um, putting five images into one and capturing the bird flying across the frame, shooting the same bird, but um, then combining them. And I think it's one of it. it to me, that's fine because that's obvious what you've done. That's not manipulating and trying to do something that's not true. That's that's being artistic and producing something that's very eye-catching. And it really yeah. is, works incredibly well in black and white with a white background, uh, makes the vultures jump out. And I think you've done it particularly well. I, I really like that a lot. That's the sort of thing that, you know, you'd want to put up on the wall. Okay, yeah, Charles, beautiful. Hello, Charles. Um, I know where Charles was when he took that. That's it. Were you with him? 
<laughs> yeah. I can't remember, Charles, if we were actually sat in the same vehicle next to one another mm. or in um, vehicles adjacent to one another. But that was uh, in uh, early December last year or late November in uh, just from a Bui Lodge in the Loire Valley at the Festival of Wildlife. And it was a wonderful, wonderful encounter with leopards, as, as you can see. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great moment. I mean, I love the one drinking and the other one watching it. It's slightly tight. So the tail of the one on the right is right up against the frame. I don't know if you've got any more space to play with, Charles. Um, and depending on your, your camera, how many megapixels you've got to play with, it might even be possible to crop out the track. I'm not so keen on the, the road, the track. It looks a bit artificial. You can maybe crop that out, have more space behind the tail on the right and make a more interesting juxtaposition of the two um, leopards. Uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful moment, but a great moment. And I love the fact both their tails curl up in the same way. That really adds to the yeah. picture as well. Yeah. So this is, this wow. is very That's unusual. Well, isn't it? It's a very eye-catching shot, Jeff. I, I um, assume, is that a buffalo? Um, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it works really, really well because you can see both eyes of the lion. You can see exactly what it is peeping through that hole. And the... The red meat is not too gory, but it tells the story very nicely captured. Um, I th I, I'm not sure I'd change anything. I mean, the top right no, corner, no. possibly, because it's all skin and fur and so on, maybe I'd try and crop that out a little bit, but that might crop it too tight. Again, if you've got other shots, you know, taken within a few seconds of this, you might have one that's slightly different. Um, but that's a minor, minor question. Yeah, the other, the other really interesting thing about this photograph is that the shape of the aperture that the lion is looking through is, broadly speaking, the shape of the eye of the lion that's looking through the aperture, uh, which I love. I, I think it's an absolute, absolutely fantastic photo. Yeah, just a lot going in there. That's a really great shot, Jeff. I could, again, with processing, I'd maybe, I know it's in shadow, but add a, keep the shadow, but add a little bit of punch to the lion's face just to make it jump out a little bit more because the your eye immediately goes to the red the meat and then the lion and you want the lion to be where your eye goes first so keep it in shadow because that's a really important part of the picture but just maybe add a little bit of punch jenny hello jenny um no jenny very well this is another wonderful shot i mean it looks if you look closely i think you can actually see the the afterbirth. So this is a very newborn yep. calf, isn't it? And it's got an ox pecker. Yes. So yeah. what I love about it is the is the grass is lovely at the, at the front. I mean, if, if you were using a camera on a monopod and got even lower, that would add even more drama. Um, but it's nice and low anyway. Beautiful position between the mother and the calf. The ox pecker adds a little bit. I'd probably brighten the calf a little bit more to match the mother just so that it's not lost in it's slightly in shadow um but it's a wonderful moment even the tongue of the mother just about to touch the, the calf's head it's, it's gorgeous it's a really really nice shot there's something about that which um which just sort of says to me that irrespective of the um very special moment of the calf having been born life goes on regardless and and that's said by the ox peckers just carrying on doing their thing they're just they're just doing what they do it's, you know, irrespective of what I'm else just, has there's, happened there's another ox pecker on the leg of the mother isn't there yeah there is yeah 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 there's two or three like on the, the neck the one thing i can't decide chris is if i like the bush if the bush adds to it or detracts from it i mean it makes it harder to see the afterbirth is one thing but but then it also it, it, yep. it's a sense of place it's sort of i don't know i can't decide if that's a key part of it or not um that that's that's an interesting one i, I uh, personally i don't like the bush there and personally I, I would consider cropping it differently so that in actual fact you have a portrait crop which is largely of the young giraffe the giraffe calf and the head of the female um back to just about where the ox peckers are just coming in from the right hand mm -hmm. side of the image um it's a cracking photo though and um 
Yeah, and, I'd certainly uh, experiment with that crop. That's a good idea, actually, because that would make it more graphic and more um, stylized. Yeah. Be yeah. if you got rid of the the back half of the giraffe and the bush, and you had the front two legs yeah. and the head, the, the, the neck coming in, you'd make you'd accentuate the long neck is the key, and then on the on the left hand side yeah. of the image would be the calf. So I, I definitely I'd have a go at that, Jenny, and brighten the calf slightly. And I think that would probably, I mean, I love the picture, but that would make it a more striking, unusual graphic image. Okay, let's keep moving. Okay. Hey, um, Black love and it. Wolf. I, I, I don't know if this is um, Yellowstone. That's where there are, there are, I think half the wolves in Yellowstone are black, aren't they? The other half, I think it's interesting because um, the black wolves are, are more, uh, immune to canine distemper virus, I think it is. And um, uh -huh. okay. so there are more of them in Yellowstone. It's much more complicated than that than in, in most other parts of North America. So I'm, I'm guessing that's probably Yellowstone. But yeah, lovely shot. It's, um, I would probably, I don't know what aperture we're using, Tina. Um, I would probably have tried to blur the background a little bit more. I don't know if you, how long the lens was or, or where you were in relation to the wolf. But that would be my one thought. You, you've got a wonderful sense of place. I love the trees, and um, you know the the, the um, backdrop is great. But if it was a bit more blurred, you still get a sense of what it is. Then the wolf would pop more from the picture. And again, don't crop it bang in the middle. Have it a little bit more so the wolf is more to the right of the frame and looking. It's looking slightly to the left. The eyes are stunning. I mean, we've got those perfect, mm -hmm. sharp and bright, and they look absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely shot. And the snow on the fur as well. A they make it. Snow. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, Tina. It's all about the lights, isn't it? I mean, you know, you can get great polar bear mums and cubs, and, uh, you know, it, it, if the light's hopeless, it doesn't work. The light on these is just fantastic. And it really brings out the detail on the the ice and the snow. All those shadows work really well. My one criticism is, criticism is the mother is looking away again, it, like like in a few of the other shots we've seen. It would be so much stronger if she just turned around. And maybe she didn't. I don't know. Sorry, Bob. Um, maybe she didn't get in the right position at all. Polar bears don't really understand photography, I find. But um, that would have then made it a 10 out of 10 shot. Gorgeous light. And if she, if her face had been lit up on one side like the two cubs, that would add to the picture enormously. And maybe you've got that again in one of the sequences. But yeah, it's it's beautiful, really beautiful. Okay, puffy with sand deals. By the way, did you hear they? It was just announced that um, the sand eel fishery in the North Sea of England and Scotland is being stopped completely from April for all fishing oh. boats from all countries. That's going to make a massive difference wow. because I mean, sand eels have, have suffered from overfishing hugely, and climate change is affecting them with the water warming. But that is having a knock-on effect with lots of seabirds, puffins in particular. Nice to see a puffin coming with a with a bill full of them. But hopefully, yeah. in the next few years, we'll see an increase in sand eel populations and a corresponding increase in um, puffin populations. So that that's good. Um, yeah, nice shot, Peter. Wow. Um, the puffins with the sand eel is a classic shot. Generally, you see it with them standing by their burrows, but coming into to land against that, that you can tell that it's the sea, and I love the sparkle on the sea. Um, and because he blurred it, uh, it's just the right amount of blur. You can see what it is. It's a bit of a colour wash with a bit of definition, but the puffin pops. And uh, the light is gorgeous. I love the light on the puffin's feet. Particularly, you can see the, the web feet and the light almost shining through it. So, yeah, that's a very nice shot. Oh, my goodness. Well, Elaine, I've never seen a um, strap toothed whale. <laughs> I'd love to know where that was taken. I've seen, I think, 83 out of the 94 species of whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And one of the ones I haven't seen is strap tooth. So, I'm incredibly jealous. It has this amazing two teeth that you can just see there that grow out of the lower jaw and they grow up and over the top of the upper jaw and almost stop the, the whale, the male, opening the upper jaw. It can only open it three or four centimetres. So extraordinary looking animal. And to get a shot of one like that, I'd love to know where you took that, Elaine. I mean, um, 
I know they're being seen at Bremer Canyon in Australia sometimes. Maybe it was there, but um, that is stunning. There are very, very, very few good pictures of um, strap-toothed whales. Uh, this is one of the best I've ever seen. So 10 points a You can read about them in here, can't you, Mark? Yeah, you can. <laughs> very good. I'm biased because it's a whale, but that is a really exceptional shot of a very, very rarely seen animal. Red squirrel, nice one, Elaine. Um, lovely colours, lovely backdrop, because it looks like it's inside the undergrowth. I love that. Um, mm. The backdrop really adds to the sense of place. A couple of things, just the, the, the top of the tail and the, the claws of two of the, the toes are just out of the frame. You've also got, if you notice, again, this is me being really picky, there's almost like a saw mark on the very right-hand side of the perch. So mm. I would have a look at what else you've got, Elaine. If you've got some, you can pull back a bit more um, to show a bit more sense of that place, not to crop the bits of the squirrel off and to get rid of that bit that makes the, the perch look more artificial, then I think you'll improve the shot dramatically. But the pose is great, you know, just feeding and the lovely position of the tail wrapped around the body. That all works really, really well. Lovely colours as well. Oh, Robin, this is interesting. So Dipper, Dipper yeah. And with a slow shutter speed. Um, and the Dipper is tack sharp. I really like that shot. It's um, So to make the water move like that, you've got to have a shutter. I don't know what you use, Robin. Fifteenth of a second, um, even slower than that, probably. Um, but it, you managed to get the Dipper to stay still. So my guess is you put... A lot, it's probably it's actually is a lot slower than a fifteenth of a second, um, but yeah, you, you um, had to take a lot of shots, I'm sure, to get the water movement and in that slow shutter speed, the dipper standing perfectly still, and he captured it. It's wonderful. My only criticism, and it's it's the situation that you were in was the the dipper is sort of hidden slightly, the tails disappearing into that rock. If you'd had just water behind, if there's any way of manoeuvring to a slightly different position, so that if it was regularly perching on that particular rock, you just had water behind, then the dipper would stand out more, and I think it would just improve the shot. But yeah, lovely and quite a hard shot to get that one. Got about four more to do, Chris. Well, it's just stunning with I know I, I... what it's all about. It's just just um, obvious why this picture works. Again, I would pull back a little bit more. Don't feel the temptation, Jack, to have it all tight in. Um, just pull back slightly more so there's room to breathe. And it looks like there wasn't particularly interesting backdrop. But, um, and I tried to maybe add a bit of detail to the backdrop. The bear is perfect, beautiful. Try and bring back a bit more of the detail in the, the ice and the snow so it's not just white. Pull back slightly and then you've got a really stonking shot. That's a Gorgeous, gorgeous reflection. So, um, yeah, but Mark, can I just, the excitement taking that. Can I can I say on that one? I think that of all of the all of the images we've had this evening um, so far, and I know we've still got another um, uh, few to go, but all of the images we've had so far have been absolutely wonderful. Of all of them, I have to say this is my personal favourite. Is it? Um, and uh, it's. It's absolutely fantastic. It to me, it looks like a painting. Um, and you know, we talk about um, the subjective side of this. And the thing that I love about this is that there is very little detail in the snow, curiously, hmm. um, which then brings my eye onto the bear. I think it's fantastic. I am actually also just going to ask you something. We've had two super polar bear shots, haven't we, so far? Hmm. But um, is it worth at this point just? Uh, perhaps you giving one or two tips in respect to photographing polar bears in the Arctic, since we have um, a polar bear in the Arctic on our screens. Uh, <laughs> it's not the easiest thing to do, is it? Well, no, um, it's simple, really. If you think, if you remember the old days of film, if you're old like us, you particularly, um, that cameras are designed to basically make everything 18% grey, as it was called. Why in studios, photographers used to use those grey cards. So that's what they're designed to do. So if you just have your camera on auto exposure and you're out photographing a polar bear in snow and ice, the picture tends to be gray. So what you need to do is brighten it up. So 
depending on the lighting conditions and you have to take what i always do in difficult situations like that is to um if there's a bear approaching or we're approaching a bear i will start taking test shots and i'll just get it right by the time we get to the bear all my shots are going to be perfectly exposed unless the light changes um, and the way to do that is you overexpose so you brighten it up so you expose by plus one stop to plus two stops depending on the conditions um, and experiment and then as i say do the test shots within that frame and then you'll get the perfect exposure every time otherwise the camera will just make the snow and the bear look gray and horrible okay let's just do the last few siberian j lovely Thank lovely you. shot tony's done a great job here i mean i don't know um how you got that tony whether uh there was food underneath maybe underneath the perch and the jays were coming in and perching up there for a moment before landing. Temptation with that kind of situation is just photograph it perched on the top, but Tony's gone for something very different and he's got it. My one criticism would be the background is pretty detailed. Um, I don't know what lens you were using and distance between you and the bird in the background and so on, but if you could blur it even more, the jay would pop. Um, you've got beautiful wing position, stunning tail, the colors and the detail in there. Are gorgeous and you've got that extra dimension the, the extra ingredient i talked about at the beginning snow so ticks a lot of boxes really really gorgeous shot and by talking about the background i'm being picky but if you've got the option to do that it's worth having a go so you can still see that it's in that coniferous forest but it's not fighting with the j for attention okay Matt, great. Jaguar, I don't know if it's probably the Pantanal, was it? it seems to be the place to go for Jaguars. The light so, yeah. is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. And I love the way you composed it, Matt. You know, you, you've done what I've been talking about. So the Jaguar isn't filling the frame, but every part of the frame is critical to the picture. I'd maybe crop a little bit more of the water off the bottom, just a tad, and then a bit more off the left, but only a minor little amount. Um, it just captures that, you know, when you've seen Jaguars there and they appear while they're watching you through the, the um, foliage along the riverbank, that's that's how you imagine them. You don't see them in such fantastic light all the time. But, yeah, the light on the eye, the mouth slightly open, the teeth, um, it works really, really well. I think it's a great shot and very beautifully composed. Okay, two more. So again, I'm not good at my turns. You're a turn expert. Are they royal turns? Um, that would be my guess. I'm not a royal turn expert, but uh, you know. Tony, sorry if you got it wrong. I don't know where it was taken. So it's starting from scratch, really. But lots of things I like about this shot. Very low down. Notice how it's down at the ground. It's at the turn's eye level, a bit lower even. And that makes you feel you're there, part of the colony, part of the group. Um, and it, it gives such impact and it means that Toby's be able to blur out the, the background, even the turns behind. Um, lovely sky. If that was just a horrible grey sky, it wouldn't work anything like as well. Um, but it's not. It's a nice dark sky with structure and detail in it. So it works really, really well. My only complaint would be that the, the bird in the middle has another one right behind it, sort of sticking out of its ear. Mm -hmm. And again, I'd look at it if you took, I'm sure you took a lot, just to look, see if there's a more comfortable juxtaposition between those two birds, which are the stars of the show. I love the one coming in and the other one looking over the top of it on the right and the ones in the background blurred. They all work fantastically well. Um, I'm not sure what that is. I've just noticed, see the one coming in on the right. There's something above it. Looks like a life boy or something like that. Just crop that out, minor. Um, but yeah, brilliant. And the low... Angle works fantastically well. Great, great shot, Tony. So, Mark, that that, that is um, they are royal turns. Just just for uh, just for clarity. And it, yeah, great. Yeah, but, um, Tony's just confirmed. Yeah, Steven, this is a lovely photo, isn't it? This is um, what's it called? A violet-tailed, not hummingbird, sylph. Because it's got the most unbelievable tail. And Stephen, you've nailed it. You've captured it. This is you see the wings. So we we're talking about that earlier with that other hummingbird shot. The rufous tailed hummingbird that's a slightly slower shutter speed it's fast enough to free look how sharp the eyes are 
and the beak and the flower and the tail, all the critical bits going down that line down the middle. And you've got a sense of movement by having a slightly shower, slower shutter speed and giving some movement in the wings. So everything that needs to be tacked sharp is, and you've got that wonderful iridescence in the tail. Um, and again, beautiful blurry background. So the, the sylph just jumps, you know, those colors against that blurry background, that color wash work really, really well. Um, I, I don't think I'd change anything that. I think it's a absolutely stunning shot. If you're going to photograph one of these birds, that's the way to do it because you show off its, its, its main thing, the main thing it's known for. Wonderful, great shot, Stephen. And a brochure cover shot, Mark. Yeah, you, Stephen, I would charge quite a lot for that when Chris asks you if you can use it for the brochure. <laughs> you won't find okay. that anywhere else. Wonderful, great. Well, we, we've done it in, oh my God, we've been ages. There's, there's a lot to talk about. There are a lot of wonderful pictures. It's been a, a really nice way of doing it. Oh, it's been absolutely fantastic. And um, there are, I just, th th there are a couple of questions I think that um, it's it's worth just sort of throwing out there. Um, one of one of which uh, relates to processing, um, and and another relates to uh, uh, which is perhaps a little bit more technical, but relates to the pros and cons of crop sensors versus full frame sensors. Okay. Um, do you want to perhaps chuck a few thoughts in on, on that one first, crop sensors versus crop sensors, full frame? Yeah, um, I'm not sure what you're thinking there, but then, particularly maybe then, at the extremes of the focal length of the lens. Yeah, so so crop sensors and full frame sensors are different, obviously, um, and they and then one's not necessarily better than the other. Um, it depends what camera you're using because the, the technology is improving all the time and there are stunning models using both. Um, and it also depends, depends what you're shooting, what other lenses and so on you've got and so on. So in a nutshell, a full frame sensor will give you um, a higher quality image. Um, it'll be better for shooting in low light and it will be giving you better um, or greater dynamic range so you can get more detail in the shadows and in the highlights and it will give you a one times magnification with your lenses I'm, I'm simplifying it but this is the, the bottom line yeah. a crop sensor is generally cheaper it's generally a smaller camera so if weight is a consideration that's something to bear in mind um, it's not so good um, and I'm generalising but generally not so good in low light with high ISOs. Um, but what it does do and the advantage is it will effectively increase the, the length of your lenses. So suppose you've got a 1.5 times crop sensor and you're using a 400 millimeter lens, then it will effectively be a 600 millimeter lens. So the big advantage of crop sensors is that you, you don't have to spend so much money on the longest lenses and you um, have smaller lenses to get the same magnification effectively because it's cropping part of the picture out. Um, it's, a, it's a balance between the two. The crop sensors tend to be less expensive, smaller, the lenses are smaller. The other negative with crop sensors is that the, it's harder to get a, a blurry background because the, um, the aperture is, is uh, smaller. So you're, you're basically you have to have a background further away to make it a blurry color wash than you would with a full frame sensor. So as I say, this it swings in roundabouts, positives and negatives. Um, I use both myself. Um, and uh, you know, depending on what you're doing, what sort of wildlife you're shooting um, and how much money you've got to spend, then that's really the consideration. The thing is, you can't tell. If, you, if you're using equipment right under the right conditions, we can't tell by looking at the photo whether it's with a crop sensor or full frame yeah. sensor, whether it's Canon or Nikon or Sony or Olympus. Um, a lot of that's all down to the photographer. So if you know the limits of what you're using, you can make either of those work very, very effectively. That's the, that's the, People do whole courses on this, but that's the short answer to the, the main differences between the two and the advantages and disadvantages. And the most important thing really is to be out there using it and enjoying using it and using it well, whichever camera you're using. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. And it's amazing what, you know, let's say judging competitions, you, you, you sort of look at a shot and it, it's a winner of a category or something. And then you see what it was taken on. And you can't believe it because, you know, it's taken on a 20 year old camera with manual yeah. everything. You know, I mean, you, you, if, if you know what you're doing and you've got an artistic eye, you can take stunning pictures with pretty much anything. Having an expensive camera is obviously an advantage and there are, it makes it easier. Focusing is quicker and the exposures it better and so on. But within the constraints, if you know what you're doing, you can take great shots with pretty much anything. So just then before we end, I'm conscious that it's 10 to 9, but um, there's still lots of people that are um, on board. In fact, the vast majority. Um, processing is quite important, isn't it? Um, with things and uh, you showed one or two absolutely super images which um, w uh, w where you had made an adjustment to the processing of the image and in one well there were two images and in one case an adjustment of the crop um, but um, an adjustment to the processing of the, of the image which was the lovely uh, young um, uh, green woodpecker um, and that makes a big difference but it's also possible to go over the top, isn't it? You can go too far. The differences need to be relatively subtle. Yeah, I mean, again, the adjustments I've been week long courses on all of this, but in a nutshell, my, my feeling is you've got to get it as close to right in the camera as possible um, and do as little processing as possible. As I've said, I'm definitely not one of these people I've been fighting against digital manipulation and changing things dramatically so they don't look like what you saw in the first place. So I do very little processing in most cases. If you're finding you're spending a lot of time processing on one image, you probably didn't get it right in the first place. So maybe, you know, that image doesn't work. Um, I use Lightroom and then Photoshop, um, and they both are used for different things. And I do use things like masking. The, the new masking in Lightroom is fantastic. It's a great way of dodging and burning, as we were talking earlier about how Ansel Adams did it in the darkroom. You can now do it in seconds in the in the in Lightroom. Um, and I think the trick is is really, I mean, any if you, hopefully you're shooting raw. You know, if you're doing this seriously, you've got to shoot raw. Then you've got you can you can do so much more with it. You'll end up with a much better result rather than shooting JPEGs. So all raw files look slightly soft and flat. So you've got to process them. Um, so you can make that shot look punchier, sharper even, slightly better cropped and so on. In 30 seconds, I mean, that I would say I rarely spend more than 30 seconds on any one image. I mean, actually, usually a lot less because I'm, I'm doing very simple tweaks to exposure, a bit of dodging and burning, um, adjusting horizons, cropping slightly and say I always have a bit of room for maneuver with cropping because I'm always wider than I know I'm going to want to be when I shoot um, a little bit of exposure and so on I use topaz for um, getting rid of noise and sharpening and that work again all very subtle you know I've seen people using topaz and they sharpen whack it up to 100 and you can see that it's been fiddled with I'm, I'm using sort of on the settings of Topaz, three, four, five, right down that end of the scale. And that's enough to get rid of noise and to just sharpen something up a little bit if it's slightly soft. So I do all that and it's very quick and can work through, I mean, I can I can work through a, a thousand photos from a day's or a morning shoot, say, um, to end up with maybe 20 shots ready to go. Could do that in an hour, an hour and a half really quickly yeah just very roughly because yeah. i'm doing very little but what you're doing i mean like the woodpecker was the example it was subtle but it did add punch and a bit mm. of brightness and that's what you're looking yeah, for really. yeah yeah it really did look mark thank you so much that's absolutely fantastic um uh i'm conscious that we're cruising towards nine o'clock uh it's been a lot of fun um it's been um informative i think um and uh uh judging by the messages that we've received um it would appear at least that uh, people have had a fun e evening um so okay. i know on behalf of us both we'd like to thank you all for taking the time to spend the evening with us 
Um, I will just very quickly before we go mention the three workshops, uh, a big part of the three um, um, evening presentations that we've got coming up. Nick Garbutt and Alex Hyde on the on the 6th of March. Um, Nick Garbutt yet again on the 12th of March. We don't let him stop. Um, and discovering the wildlife of the UK with Mike Dillard on the 14th. Um, but Mark, a, a huge thanks to you. Uh, lots of fun as we as we knew it would be. Um, but we couldn't have done it without the amazing images that we were sent, could we? Well, we sent some fantastic shows. No, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone who sent images in. And, and as I said at the beginning, huge apologies if we didn't get to cover yours. It was just too many and, and it, no reflection on your photography. I'm impressed with how many fantastic photographers there are out there. And like I said, I'm very picky and I'm sort of trained to pick find fault. Um, but the standard was exceptionally high, I have to say. I'd have been very, very happy to have taken a lot of those pictures that we saw tonight. So it was great, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Great fun. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again on the 6th of March with Nick and Alex. Mark, thanks a lot. Bye, thanks a lot.